Western art has always been obsessed with madness. We seem to want to believe that artists need to be mad in order to be truly creative. The mad are everywhere in our drama, from Hamlet and King Lear to the madness of King George III. The great novels of the 19th and 20th century are full of strange, bizarre, inexplicable characters. The architecture of our mental hospitals and prisons for the criminally insane haunt our imaginations. The straitjacket, the ECT machine, the tranquilizing injection are among our most potent cultural symbols. try and find out what people think about the creative powers of sanity and madness. Have the mad always been given the best lines in literature and drama? And have we always thought that mad people would make better artists than sane people? Why was Shakespeare so interested in his mad characters? In the 18th century, the age of enlightenment, the age of rationality, what did people think about the idea of the mad artist? How does the literature of romanticism of the 19th century fit into this? And how did 19th century ideas help to shape the controversial anti-psychiatry movement in the 1960s? And what about sanity and madness today? Do we still think that mad people make better artists? That a sane art is impossible? These are the kind of questions I want to ask in this film. And in a society in which one in four people has a mental health problem, and in a world in which one suicide occurs every 40 seconds, it has never been more important to ask these questions. In addition to writing a new book called Going Sane, the psychoanalyst Adam Phillips has been investigating why mad characters often seem to have the best lines in fiction, and whether we think mad people or people with madness in them make better artists. I wanted to talk the ideas through with him, and I'm going to see how he's getting on with his research. Jonathan Levi's film follows Adam Phillips as he turns to history, psychology and the arts to attempt to discover the links between sanity, insanity and creativity. Where can we find the very beginnings of the idea that madness and creativity are related? Everybody has an idea that anybody who creates any kind of artwork, in a sense, gets it from elsewhere. Now, the elsewhere could be the gods, it could be God, it could be the unconscious, it could be just called inspiration. But it's as though there is an elsewhere inside us that really is quite alien to us. It's remarkably persistent. It's persisted for two and a half millennia in the West, and it's still in many people. You get in a state of inspiration as a songwriter or whatever, and it comes out better than sitting down and, uh, and doing it by craft. And so, and so does its persistence suggest anything to you? What's interesting here is that we're bewitched by the idea of something inside us that's in excess of us. It's almost as though we can't bear the idea of being as small as we are in the cosmos. We want to be linked to some supernatural force that makes us somehow feel that the grandiosity of our lives, even the grandiosity of our suffering, makes our lives meaningful. If the great poetry, the great works of art, come out of uh, an area which is inspired, which is uh, out of reach of most normal people, which is irresponsible. It's the irresponsibility of the artist, the uh, permitting the artist to be, in a loose, loose use of the word, mad, that begins there, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, there's a very basic fear, isn't there, here, which is a superstitious anxiety about the unpoliced imagination. And you get this in contemporary life, in psychoanalysis, where in free association, Freud effectively says, don't sense yourself, say what comes ever, whatever comes into your mind. When people say whatever comes into their mind, they say the most extraordinary things. And it becomes quite clear how much policing is going on. That's to say, we are nine-tenths just ventriloquist dummies of the culture. And then every so often we say something really idiosyncratic and strange. And that becomes, it's most clearly uh, demonstrated for our 
in, in the West, in Hamlet, where we have uh, a conversation about madness. So let's talk about the madness in Hamlet, in his uh, encounter with Polonius. What is that saying about madness, first of all, and the artist? It's a very interesting moment in Hamlet, because at this moment, the apparently sensible, apparently bourgeois man, Polonius, has a dawning thought, which is, there's something very extraordinary about the way ha Hamlet speaks. How does my good Lord Henry? Well, God of mercy. Do you know me, my lord? Excellent well. You are a fishmonger. Not I, my lord. Then I would you were so honest a man. Honest, my lord? Aye, sir. To be honest as this world goes is to be one man picked out of ten thousand. That's very true, my lord. Or if the sun breed maggots in a dead dog. Have you a daughter? I have, my lord. Polonius is powerfully moved by Hamlet, though he doesn't understand by what. And, and so it's as though, through Hamlet's apparently mad words, Hamlet has communicated far more, far more intensely, than through, as it were, straightforward, sensible communications. Conception is a blessing, but as your daughter may conceive, friend, look to it. How say you by that still harping on my daughter? Yet he knew me not at first. He said I was a fishmonger. He's far gone. Far gone. Hamlet, um, who is um, either mad or pretending to be mad or mad some of the time, is, is the most intelligent and inventive person on the stage. But also highly excitable, mm. aggressive, arrogant, and spins words in such a way that he can easily seem deranged even when he maybe doesn't want mm. to. Mm. I have heard of your painting through well enough. God has given you one face and you make yourselves another. You dig, you amble, you list, you nickname God's creatures and make your wantonness your ignorance. Get thee to a nunnery and quickly too. Farewell. Or if thou is needs, Mary, marry a fool, for wise men know well enough what monsters you make of them. Go to I no more of it. <laughs> It has made me mad. To pretend he's mad, or, or, or to believe he's mad, give out that he's mad, um, is a way of dealing with behaviour that otherwise would be culpable. If he's mad, it seems less culpable, I suppose. Mm. In Midsummer Night's Dream, Theseus says, the lunatic, the lover, and the poet are of imagination all compact. They're the ones who do the imagining. He actually says, the madman sees more devils than vast hell can hold, so he associates madness with demonic possession, which again was quite common. Aristotle and Plato both associate melancholy with genius. Um, there's a certain amount of work done, isn't there, on the amount of um, manic depression, the c c c c commonness of manic depression among artists and poets and so on. It seems to be very common. <laughs> How he follows me, how cold no one blows the cold wind. Huh? Go to thy cold bed and warm thee. Get uh, dark in all to thy daughter, so not thou come to this. So thee is added to poor Tom, and the foul fiend that led through fire and through flame. Through in King Lear, Edgar plays the madman, a gibbering madman, naked on a heath in a storm, a lunatic. And he says things that a lot of people would have thought even today were just nonsense. So there's a nonsense madness. This is the art of control. It's not the wise madness of Hamlet. It's, you know, this is the foul fiend, for liberty gibbet. He begins at curfew and walks till the first cock. He gives the web and the pin, squints the eye and makes the hair lip, mildews the white wheat. So, and so on. Now, is he telling us that this is the way madness was regarded in that society then? What's interesting, I think, about Shakespeare is that he's interested in madness as a language. What Shakespeare seems to be saying is, and this seems very contemporary, is mad people speak in an extraordinary way. And one of the things about mad people is they seem to be able to perform being mad as well as, as it were, being mad. Or we wonder, really, what they want us to think they're saying. They perplex us. And I think that it's something about... I think mad people are very important to Shakespeare because it's as though they, Im they enact how perplexing language is, especially when it's at its most intensely poetic. Blow with the track, your cheeks! 
Shakespeare is mad, and we probably don't want to. We do, though, want to believe that some of the greatest artists were mad. So if madness is a necessary ingredient of the art that we value, are mental hospitals likely to be the places where we find the most creative people, the greatest art? My own feeling is that the connection between mental illness and creativity is somewhat positively exaggerated. I think that generally speaking, mental illnesses don't make people more creative. Sanity or a healthy mental life is really about having as many creative options as possible, being able to be as creative and flexible as possible. So that what we notice in people who have mental illnesses, whose sanity is challenged, if you like, is that they have less flexibility about how they respond to even quite everyday stresses, that they have less capacity to use their talents, that they have less capacity to regulate their moods and their thoughts, that they have less capacity to connect well with other people, so that they lose things. It's a, it's a, it's a process of loss. On the other hand, we do know about people where something about their imagination seems to have been liberated by their mental illness. And there is something, I think, that has a little in common between mental illness and creativity in that there's something about being prepared to think outside the box, being able to see things perhaps a different way from how most people see things. And, of course, there's nothing about mental illness that makes you less intelligent. The person who did this picture has utilized many different types of symbol here to say something about their experience in Broadmoor. They're conveying something about a type of black humor about their experience. They're containing something that says something about medication, this image, this figure is holding a hypodermic syringe. They're saying something about the policies and procedures from way outside the hospital that affect daily life, often in enormous ways that I suspect the people who write these policies have no idea. And of course it makes one think of is the fool in Lear and how important the fool is in helping Lear to understand his transition from someone who's really quite organized into his mind to someone who's really quite disorganized. Tis foul. He that ever has to put his head in has a good head face. No, I will be the pattern of all patients. I will say nothing. One of the reasons that we don't always realize uh, that, uh, that people are psychiatrically ill, that actually that can be hidden, is because a mental illness doesn't necessarily affect all your capacities. That's the other reason why mental illness and creativity can coexist, is because the fact that you might have some very abnormal beliefs or struggle a great deal with mood swings wouldn't necessarily affect any other talent you might have for playing the violin or painting. And in fact, it's not, it, is, uh, it is often said that, that actually, one of course, people's creativity can sometimes be uh, a solace for them. <laughs> 